Welcome to Good Game, I'm Hex. And I'm Bajo. This week on the show, we rack up the frequent flyer mileage as we travel the universe in the remastered Homeworld collection. So many space games this year, Hex. I've learned to pack light. Oh, yeah. Although you don't really need to in space, because, you know, it's Well, it's weightless. more about space, isn't it? I mean, no, like volumetric space. space. No, I mean space, not space. Uh, well, for your luggage. To... No, space, not space. It has been forbidden to possess this information for some time. We feel compelled to share it with you. Behold. And we do hard time in The Escapists. We also dive into a couple of games that are in early access. The Aussie developed Stranded Deep and the highway hijinks of Road Redemption. But before all that, let us take a moment to ponder the question of can you name the game for this week? <laughs> Fresh fish! Get your ass on the line! Together, Ben Massey and Sam Edwards are the Brisbane-based developer Beam Team, and they've been hard at work creating the survivalist castaway game, Stranded Deep. Stranded Deep is currently in early access, so it is pretty bare bones right now, but there is a game there to play. It begins in the sky. <laughs> After a martini-based crafting tutorial, this happens. <laughs> then you're stranded. There's nothing to see on the horizon except a handful of small islands. You have with you a knife, a lifeboat and an oar. And you must simply survive. Ah, uh, Hex, I'm always up for a bit of survival gaming, and this is such a fun setting for it. You'll be logging, collecting, crafting a home, searching for food and drinking water, exploring shipwrecks, and attempting to stab marine life. And, of course, watching out for those pesky sharks. I, I, last time I... Came across a shark, he just left me alone. These guys are hungry. Maybe they only hunt in packs. Oh no! Oh! Oh! Even though this is only the foundation for the full game, the core mechanics are all there. In fact, the interface is quite polished, especially compared to other survival games that we've played in Alpha. Gathering materials and building a house is all quite functional and intuitive. And it's so beautiful, isn't it? Yeah, those sunsets. And the water is beautiful too. Most of all, I liked how minimal that HUD is. There's just basic notifications to notify you if you're getting hungry, for example. Otherwise, it's all clean. I'm gonna take my bed with me. <laughs> uh, the, no! Okay, I'm abandoning the bed. One interesting feature is that all of the islands are procedurally generated, so different each time, and I like that, but I just wish there was more that would kill you. Never in my life. Did I think I'd be playing video games where I blow whistles at crabs? <laughs> Alright, let's get back to business. Yeah, there's not a whole lot of threat to your life right now, is there? Although those trees can be pretty hazardous. How do I... How do I get down? I don't know if it's gonna... Oh! Oh! Okay, that was not that was not a good plan. I'm not sure I could completely recommend Stranded Deep just yet, but what is there is well made. And I did like how each new piece of equipment I'd find gave me hope of one day constructing something to help me leave the island. What is it? E. Okay. Oh, can I use it? <laughs> I like how isolated you feel on these little islands, but mostly I like thinking about the possibilities for this game. Sickness, or pirates and other scavengers, or maybe crazy storms that just destroy everything you've built. Ooh, maybe there'll be a Kraken. I love a good Kraken. Well, we'll keep an eye on this as it progresses, but for now, another game that we've been having a bit of a play with is the motorbike mayhem of Road Redemption. Ah, 
Hex, you and I are such big fans of the old school Road Rash games. It's just a shame that a bunch of dud sequels in the 90s killed off the series. Yeah, I mean, there were the old rumours that EA was going to revive the franchise, but that sort of never happened. So it's a good thing that this spiritual successor has revved onto the scene. We should point out that Road Redemption is made by a completely different developer and isn't meant to be a Road Rash sequel in any way. But even in this early state, it successfully recreates Road Rash's DNA of racing and combat. Yeah, it certainly is brutal. It's almost like those old biker rivalries have erupted into an all-out war now. You can still trade blows with baseball bats, but these are now the tamest options, compared to far more lethal weapons like assault rifles and grenade launchers. At first I was a bit worried about the guns. There's already so much going on on the road. You're ducking and weaving, avoiding traffic. I thought they might be a bit too fiddly, but they've nailed it. So much so that I always go for the guns over melee, especially during those assassination missions. Yeah, I'm not completely sold in the assassination mode just yet. As you said, they work well if you've got a good gun, but if you're stuck with just melee, there's often no way to take down enough bikers before the time limit runs out. And if it's a rooftop level, forget about it. Yeah, those rooftop levels are a great idea, but they're definitely the weakest part of the game. Plus, the physics feel a bit wonky because you're suddenly able to knock metal vents around like they're cardboard boxes. But then I'd instantly forget all those issues each time I nailed some crazy takedown in the middle of a jump. Worth it. Yeah, you're right. The game's sense of fun is just so infectious, isn't it? Does it make sense for your rider to hallucinate cars falling out of the sky? No, but it's hilarious. Yeah, it's kind of like riding in the wake of a tornado. The sticky bombs were by far my favourite. And under all of these outrageous moves, there's a robust combat engine too, with grabs and counterattacks. Another interesting tweak they've made is building the campaign around permadeath. And this adds some real stress to it when you're one crash away from death. True, but to counter that, your health and turbo are topped up with each takedown. And that reminds me a lot of the Burnout series, which is a good thing, and that certainly makes you a more aggressive racer. Mm. I think they've already got the combat really well polished, but my only real concern at this point is the racing itself. The bikes feel far too light. There's just no real weight to them when you're cornering. For me, it's just a little bit too arcadey. Yeah, I think there's a lot of work to be done on the handling in general. I was so happy that they included split-screen multiplayer, though. There's just something a bit special about hitting your friends with a spade while riding a motorbike at high speed. <laughs> yeah, it definitely suits the game's retro remake vibe, doesn't it? The multiplayer is still very buggy, though, and the online co-op is yet to be added. So if multiplayer is important to you, then I'd hold off playing this until the game is more complete. Yeah, I agree. It's good to see the single player shaping up nicely, though. And now here is Goose with the news. Here's what's making headlines. The annual Game Developer Conference was held last week in San Francisco and brought with it a slew of hardware and software announcements. Epic Games announced its Unreal Engine 4 will now be available for free to everyone, abandoning their previous subscription model. However, developers will need to pay a 5% royalty on gross revenues after their games have made just under $4,000. Meanwhile, Unity launched its latest engine, Unity 5, also offering developers access to a free personal edition as well as a more robust professional edition available with a monthly subscription. And Valve officially revealed its long-anticipated source 2 engine. It will also be free to developers, however Valve did not announce when the engine would be available, or Half-Life 3. Valve also made several hardware announcements confirming that Steam machines will officially launch this November alongside the Steam controllers, as well as a device known as the Steam Link. The Steam Link Box will enable game streaming from a PC to a TV across a local home network. Valve is also partnering with tech company HTC to make a virtual reality headset known as the Vive. In addition to positional head tracking, the headset will have full 3D room tracking, which will be able to track users' movements within their own environment. The device is planned to ship within the year. And in more VR news, Sony revealed its plans to release a consumer model of the PlayStation 4 VR headset, the Morpheus, within the first half of 2016.
And finally, in some sad news, actor and cultural icon Leonard Nimoy passed away at the age of 83. The actor rose to fame for his iconic portrayal of science officer Spock in the original 1960s Star Trek series, a role that inspired generations of stargazers. Tributes have since been flowing in from around the world and beyond, with astronaut Terry Virts giving the Vulcan salute from the International Space Station, while around a thousand players within Star Trek Online gathered on Vulcan to pay their respects. Developers of Star Trek Online, Star Citizen and Elite Dangerous have all pledged to memorialise Nimoy within their games. And that's all for this week. Live long and prosper. Thanks, Goose. The Escapist is a top-down pixel adventure set in a prison where your goal is to Shawshank your way out of there without getting caught. After a quick tutorial, you're ready to attempt your first escape. But don't expect to take those first steps as a free person unless you're willing to play the long game. The first thing you'll learn is that prison life operates on a pretty tight schedule. Morning roll call, meals, time for work, exercise and so forth. You need to be present and accounted for at all of these places at the times they take place. Or alarms will sound and you'll basically get shot on sight. Stay alert and pay attention to everything that's going on, however, and you'll often witness fights and beatdowns, leaving prisoners unconscious for long enough for you to go through their belongings. And you start to find and collect items that you can use to bargain with or aid in your escape. You can also apply for a job to earn a bit of cash to buy useful items, although I found it easier just to do shady favours for other inmates for money. Usually it involved retrieving a stolen item or beating up someone for someone else. But don't go into a fight without a weapon or it will end badly. You can craft one from other items, but you'll need to raise your intelligence first by surfing the internet in your free time. You can also steal weapons from other inmates, but again, getting into fights requires strength. So during those compulsory exercise periods, you do actually have to lift weights to get your health up. And that literally involves just spamming Q and E until you're too fatigued, both in and out of the game. Not exactly my idea of fun, Bajo. I do like that there are so many aspects involved in every step of this game, though. And finally, getting your hands on a shiv or something equally useful feels like a small but exciting victory. Yeah, but you can never just knuckle down and focus on cultivating your plan, though. Because the meals and the roll call and the more meals, you're constantly having to show up to each one of these places, and I found it all starting to get a bit tedious. Yeah, but that's prison life, man. Like we said, it's the long game. You need to take tiny steps towards your escape plan every day without getting caught. Yeah, I, I know. It's just a kind of patience that I guess I don't have. Not to mention mistakes are costly. Lose a fight and you'll end up in the infirmary and have all of your contraband taken away from you. So anything you've collected and were keeping on your person, gone. I mean, those kinds of backward steps are devastating. You can store items in the desk in your cell to keep them safe, but cells get raided nightly, so there's that to worry about as well. But Hex, it was when I was searching other people's cells that I found the most useful stuff. It's hard knowing as well what to hang on to, because you could come across a crafting note later that that item could be relevant for. I love all the little comments and chatter from Prison Life, made funnier by the fact that you can name all of the inmates and guards whatever you like. I think we're seeing a return to these kinds of pixel games now. And maybe that's because there's a strange satisfaction from those little daily accomplishments. Mm. I mean, I could see from what I played of this that there is a lot of room for improvisation. Many different ways to try and plan your escape. But it's an arduous process, and I think this kind of game really appeals to a particular kind of gamer, and I'm just not one of them. I am. I think it's thrilling in its own way. Smuggling a guard's uniform into your cell, saving it for when you're finally able to make your escape. Waiting for just the right moment? Yeah, well, after days of mashing Q&E in the gym and browsing the prison internet and getting into fights and collecting the things I needed, I found a file to cut through the vent in my cell. But it wasn't enough. I needed another file. So I got one, and in the dead of night, I finally made my way through the vent. But no, instant fail. 
I just ended up in solitary. You can load from previous saves, but I just didn't feel compelled or engaged enough to do that. Well, this game is generating quite a lot of excitement online, and I think it's for those sorts of people who like to share stories and swap tips on forums. I think they get the most out of it. Similar to Papers, Please, for example. There is a slow repetitiveness to it, yes, but also a particular kind of reward from that patience and strategy. See, I wasn't a massive fan of that game either, although I know it was equally loved by many. I think for me, a game in this genre that I really connected with was Actual Sunlight. Because it had a narrative and a core message that, for me, actually made all those menial actions worthwhile. This just didn't do it for me, and I got frustrated and bored pretty quickly. What are you going to give it, Hex? Well, while I'm sure that many people will relish in this particular brand of strategic tedium, for me it was a two-star experience. I like this a lot. I'm giving it three stars. In the early 90s, there was a craze taking over the world. Rollerblades. If you didn't blade, you weren't cool. I remember purchasing my pair of rollerblades out of the back of some guy's boot, and they were by far the worst things I've ever owned in my life. But soon we were able to live out our rollerblading dreams with the racing game Skitchin'. Skatin', Hitchin', Bitchin'. Skitchin'. That was the tagline. Skitchin'! The races took place on a variety of streets and was commentated by a ragtag bunch of cool bitchin' hosts, including a punk Michael Keaton. It was Battle of the Blades, the National Skitchin' Championships. So what is Skitchin'? Well, to sketch means to grab onto the back of a car and get some extra speed and also a free ride. It's a fabulous way to die in real life. But in video game land, it served as a delightful setup for six styled skater racing. But one does not simply sketch in peace. No, 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 no. This is life and death, and in true road rash style, you have to fight off various generic punks to reach first place. On top of this, the streets had plenty of obstacles and the most rad sickest of jumps. Cops were a problem. Falamos. A true skitcher would grab the back of a cop car. A true skitcher has no fear. A true skitcher would push the line until it was bust or crust. Skitchin wasn't a great game, and it wasn't a genre that people were actually into. And it was riding the success of Road Rash a bit. But ultimately, it was just a little too basic. Even so, I played so much of this game, especially split screen with friends. And that music! Oh, such heavy thrash death metal riffs that tapped into my inner rebel. Sketch on, bitches. from anywhere in the system, not even beacons. We are all that's left of our world, our culture, our people. Strike group, prepare for assault. Our weapons are having minimal effects on the alien vessel. We must focus on the matter at hand, elimination of the fleet that destroyed our world. Homeworld was originally released way back in 1999 and it became an instant classic. It was the first fully 3D real-time strategy game, letting gamers command their very own epic space battles. It snagged a bunch of Game of the Year awards at the time, which was impressive because it was the first game that Relic Entertainment had ever made. And now the good folks over at Gearbox have stepped in to give the game a new lease on life, with a collection that includes the original Homeworld 1 and 2 and a remastered version of each. All systems green. Release crew standing by. What a beautiful sight. Resourcing online. Construction online. Cryogenic subsections A through J online. Hex, sadly, I missed out on both of these games back in the day, and you haven't been able to buy these digitally until now. Yeah, I never played them either, but I can see why they made such an impact. Because for me, as much as I love the gameplay, I just found the story so moving. Yeah, it hits you right in the feels at times, doesn't it? Which is rare for a strategy game. 
As the game starts, we find ourselves learning a bit of the history of the Kushan people, who have long since forgotten their origins. But 100 years ago, they discovered an ancient artifact, which shows the coordinates of a planet located halfway across the galaxy that bears the name Higara, their ancient word for home. So the whole planet unites to launch an expedition to find this ancient homeworld. They spent generations building a huge mothership and inventing new technologies like faster than light travel to make the journey possible. But after they launched the test flight of the mothership, they returned to find their planet utterly destroyed. Now all that's left of their people are those aboard the mothership, and their only hope of survival is to find this mysterious homeworld. I mean, talk about motivation. And just that moment when they come back and that music plays, I mean, God, it's just genuinely gut-wrenching. No one's left. Everything's gone. Carrick is burning. I just needed to get these people home, Bajo. But I think a large part of me was just smitten by the Battlestar Galactica vibe of it all. The last survivors of an entire race traveling across the galaxy in one armada. I was getting my Commander Adama on big time. Not every space game is Battlestar Hex. Oh, come on, it's pretty much the same story. There are some similarities, but it is a great sci-fi universe, isn't it? We've completed decrypting data from the enemy frigate we captured in the Karak system. As soon as it starts, you can just feel all the lore and backstories they've created coming through. For 13 generations, we have protected it from the unclean. Yeah, apparently the original game manual was just a big book of history and stories and all that kind of thing. That doesn't surprise me. One thing I found quite striking was the fact that there are almost no characters, but there's still so much personality in the ship designs. I'm taking hit here. Confirmed. Heavy fire confirmed. And there's a lot to be said for the great battle chatter your ships make. I have a bad feeling about this. Yeah, but we can do it. It feels like there are people on board these ships. Yeah, that's a nice touch. There is one major character mentioned by name, though, Karen Sajet. She's a scientist who sacrificed herself to be integrated into the mothership to essentially become the entire bridge crew. It's a really clever way to personalise the ship and makes you feel so much more protective of it and ultimately her. And as your armada inches ever closer towards your destination, you learn more and more about the story of your people and how you came to find yourselves half a galaxy away from home. It's compelling stuff. Oh, for sure, but more importantly, it's backed up with great gameplay. So obviously the fully 3D environment is the game's trademark. You're in space, so you can go any which way you want. Most things do tend to play out across one plane though, but big ships have weak points above and below, so it pays off to try and maneuver your forces cleverly. At first I found this intimidating, but it's actually a pretty straightforward strategy, and I found moving your ships around was quite intuitive. Yeah, and I liked how they mixed up your situation quite frequently. Each mission throws something new your way, whether it's being ambushed in a nebula or having to clear a path through an asteroid field. It always keeps you on your toes, which I liked. It can be a bit slow at times, though. Move order confirmed. Defensive tactics confirmed. Especially later on, once you have those big capital ships that take forever to move across the map. Group two reporting. Hurry up, guys. Strike group coordinates locked in. Group one standing by. Strike group coordinates locked in. Yeah, I wouldn't mind seeing a few game speed controls. But the slower pace does help when those epic battles start raging, giving you enough time to see what's going on and figure out a plan without overwhelming you. I like how you carry your units with you from one mission to the next. It makes you get invested in your fleet. Every ship you build is a commitment and every single loss is meaningful. Yeah, losing ships hurts a bit, doesn't it? Most strategy games make units feel disposable. You just collect resources, churn out guys, send them off to their doom, and then churn out some more. But I felt really protective of my fleet. Yeah, especially because your resources are limited. So if you're not careful, you'll make life harder for yourself later on. Mm, yeah, you've got to play smart. And I did love using those salvage corvettes. These little guys can scoot into a battle and literally just steal enemy ships. Yoink. Copy. Yeah, pro tip, steal as many ships as you can. And how great is it when you manage to nab one of the biggest ships, like a heavy cruiser or a destroyer? It annoyed me, though, how the friendly AI would shoot the ships you're stealing. Guys, I'm clearly stealing this ship. Stop shooting it. Stabilizers offline. <laughs> yeah, that is annoying. Generally, though, I thought the AI was pretty good. Cabin pressure dropping. Although, in the last mission, for some reason, all my capital ships just decided to spin around on the spot, refusing to do anything that I told them.
that about? Space madness. Maybe. Other than that, I didn't really encounter any bugs. Of course, that's all just Homeworld 1. Homeworld 2 is a pretty safe evolution without any massive changes to the formula. It's mostly little tweaks, like putting fighters and corvettes into squadrons rather than having to wrangle them as individual units, or having to use marine frigates to capture ships in the middle of battle rather than using the salvage corvettes. Stand by for contact. See you inside. Yeah, but I don't think there was much they really needed to change, so more of the same in this case is a good thing. Although, the story in Homeworld 2 wasn't quite as strong in my opinion. It just didn't have that same epic motivation and drive as the first. But the missions are still fun and well designed. We also checked out a bit of the original games for comparison. And they've done a good job of tidying up the user interface. And of course, adding in loads of graphical bells and whistles. It's actually a bit of a shock going back and seeing that there were no widescreen resolutions. I sometimes forget that back in the late 90s, there was no widescreen. We were stuck with CRT monitors. <laughs> Oh, how do we ever live like that? I don't know, Hex. I just don't know. One thing I noticed is that you used to have to wait at the end of each mission for your resource collectors to gather up everything before moving on, unless you wanted to miss out on valuable resources. We're coming home. Resources transferred. Let's go. And they're so slow. Thankfully, the remastered versions just gather all the resources automatically when you hyperspace out to the next mission. Good call. They also seem to have got rid of fuel. Fighters and corvettes would actually run out of fuel before. But that mechanic seems to be completely scrapped. And I think that helps streamline the combat, but it does make most support vessels a tad redundant. But other than that, they seem to be pretty faithful recreations. The multiplayer side of both games has been combined into one mode, which is still in beta at this stage. But it all seemed to work fairly well, letting you select which version you want to play. Yeah, I think this is much more of a single player RTS though. The pacing just isn't that suited to competitive play. It's still fun, but it's not the kind of game I'd recommend for its multiplayer. Heavy Corvette complete. Although I do like how you can just hyperspace your whole fleet right up to the enemy. Initiating hyperspace jump. Surprise, mothership! Hyperspace jump complete. Strike group receiving fire. And it's good to see that there's official mod support too, with mods built right into the game's launcher. There didn't seem to be anything available at the moment, but looking through the history of mods for the original Homeworld games, you can find loads of mods for pretty much any classic sci-fi that you can think of. Yes, well, hopefully the community embraces the game and we'll see some of those mods for the new versions. But what do you think overall, Hex? What more could you want from a remaster? I mean, here are two absolute classic games that were almost impossible to track down that have now been lovingly remastered for a new generation. And they've thrown in the original two games for good measure. Mm. I loved it. I'm giving it four and a half out of five stars. I'm giving it four and a half as well. Has a weakness. Tell me. Cat pictures. He freaking loves them. Can't resist them. That's how you break down his firewall. Distract him with cat pictures. Who is this? A friend. Dave Callan, is that you? What? No, uh, look at that thing over there with the shiny. Um, uh... Hey, did you manage to guess the game this week? It was Prison Break the Conspiracy from March of 2010. Based on the TV show, you played as undercover agent Tom Paxton, who was on a mission from a covert group known as The Company. Come on, boss. Prison? Set in Fox River State Penitentiary, the game had nine chapters, and following a rough and rocky development history, was panned by critics and players. This is prison. I'm not here to make friends. And it's our name, The Game, because why else? It was set in a prison, just like this week's The Escapists. Next week, we're back in the slammer again with Resident Evil Revelations 2. What the hell is that thing? This island is completely crazy. And we try our luck with the locally developed Hand of Fate. Let the cards fall where they may. And over on Spawn Point, our show for younger gamers on ABC3 this weekend, we head to the Xenoverse in a new Dragon Ball Z game. Until next time, may all your games be good ones. Hex out. Arjo out. Be the cartoon that one, Dragon Ball Z. Mm, very popular. What was your favourite cartoon when you were a kid? Well, I liked a bit of Rocco's Modern Life, but really it was Ren and Stimpy that warped and shaped oh, my I brain. Oh, that. Oh no, I was all into <laughs> X Men and gargoyles. Oh, I had a brain flashback. It was an amazing, amazing gargoyles Game Boy game. 
Was oh, it? So good. So good. Oh, I miss it. Goliath.